Welcome to the Newstat Lit Fest for 2020. I am Carrie White. I am your Zoom host for this week's events. We are so glad that you are here with us. We are looking forward to a week full of exciting um, discussions and uh, explorations around world literature. Okay, I am going to go ahead and launch us. Um, our moderator for our opening session today will be R.C. Davis Indiano. He's Executive Director of World Literature Today and New Staff Professor at the University of Oklahoma. Again, I'm Carrie White. I am your Zoom host for this week's events. And I am going to really get us running with a welcome from the President of the University of Oklahoma. Joseph Harris. Hello, I'm OU President Joe Harris. I was honored to be invited to share a few words with you for this year's Newstat Lit Festival, an annual celebration of literary excellence. Like most things in 2020, this year's festival is a little different, but it's both exciting and reassuring that this virtual format is bringing people together from all over the world in a way that's never been done before. You know better than anyone the power of literature. It unites, inspires, and teaches us. It creates and fosters a culture of community. Our minds and hearts are open to new ideas and different perspectives, values that are especially important today. We're also thrilled that this year marks the 50th anniversary of the Newstat Prize. For half a century, the award has honored some of the world's most exceptional authors across the literary spectrum. Beginning with the first laureate, Giuseppe Ungarete, in 1970, through our newest recipient, Ishmael Cotteré. We're incredibly proud that the University of Oklahoma and our award-winning magazine, World Literature Today, are home to this prestigious honor. In many ways, the new Stat Lit Festival and its celebration of literary voices from across the globe epitomizes our essential purpose at OU, to change lives. We thank the Newstat family for their outstanding and longtime support for our university, and we thank all of you who are joining us for this year's festival. And now let me turn things over to R.C. Davis. Good morning, everyone. It's so great to see all these uh, beautiful faces. I am R.C. Davis Indiano, Executive Director of the World Literature Today organization, and I want to welcome each and every one of you to the 2020 Newstat Lit Fest at the University of Oklahoma. Thank you so much for joining this inaugural virtual uh, Newstat Lit Fest. It's a celebration of literature and culture from around the world. On Wednesday night, as the main event of the 2020 Newstat Lit Fest, World Literature Today will give the Newstat International Prize for Literature to Mr. Ismael Kadare, made possible by the Newstat family of Dallas, Denver, and Watertown. The Newstat prizes bring international renown and prestige to the writers who win them. The Newstat Lit Fest is also a celebration of literature and the arts with public symposia, theater productions, dance, and musical performances that create a cultural backdrop for the work of the Newstat Laureate. The event is a living monument to the power of literature to enhance the appreciation of culture worldwide. In this opening session, we wanna give you a preview of the events to come today, tomorrow, and Wednesday. I am joined by Kathy Newstat, a member of the legendary Newstat family that has done so much to create student opportunities and institutional advancement at OU. Kathy, thanks for being here and helping to welcome people to the Lit Fest. Excited to be here and thanks everyone from all over the world and, and Oklahoma for being there uh, with us today. Something like 46 different countries. Amazing. I'm also joined by Dr. Daniel Simon, the editor in chief and assistant director of World Literature Today. Thanks for joining us, Daniel. Want to say hi? Hi, thank you, uh, RC, and thank you, Kathy. Really, I'm delighted to be here with everyone today. Okay, I'd like the three of us to do a couple of things. One, to walk through the events of this week, 
Daniel, could you take us through the three events scheduled uh, just for today? Absolutely. So at the top of the hour today, we will have the Balkans uh, panel, which is called Understanding the Balkans, hosted by the OU College of International Studies. It's moderated by Dustin Condren, who is a professor of Russian here at OU. And we'll have John Cox from North Dakota State University, um, Ellen Green from the University of Oklahoma, and Lurieta Yashinaku from Albania. Uh, she is an Albanian writer. And we'll talk a little bit about censorship and self-censorship under the regime as she experienced it. Uh, Dr. Cox will talk a little more broadly about the Balkans and his work as a translator, historian, and literary scholar. And uh, Dr. Green will speak about classical antiquity in Kadare's work in a novella called Agamemnon's Daughter. So that will be our first event today. And after that, we'll have later this afternoon, a reading event by the nine jurors who make up the 2021 NSK Neustadt Prize for Children's Literature jury. They are all phenomenal writers in their own right. And so this afternoon, the spotlight will be on them rather than on their nominees. And they will give a reading for uh, that, that event, which starts at five o'clock central time. We'll be doing book uh, giveaways during, uh, throughout the hour, as well as breakout rooms with the writers. So you can actually go into a, one of the rooms and join them um, during uh, just after their reading. So that's also this afternoon. And then finally tonight, we'll have the launch of the book uh, anthology that has been edited for the anniversary of the, of the Newstat Prize. It's called Dispatches from the P Republic of Letters. It's a project that I've been working on for a couple of years now, and I'm really excited to have it uh, make its debut in the world. So I'll be joined by the publishers, and then we'll have, again, some book giveaways, and, and we'll talk about the genesis of the book and what it represents in terms of the history of the prize. Hey, Daniel, can I jump in for a second? So this anthology is a very special, uh, launching this anthology is a very special event for us. Could you talk just a little more about it, how it uh, came about and um, how people can get a copy of it? Well, it came about two years ago when you and I were having a conversation about the anniversary coming up in 2020. And so we decided to go forward with it. And, and now the end result is that we have this beautiful, um, amazing anthology of the first 25 winners of the Neustadt Prize. So from Ungaretti to Danticat, from 1970 to 2018, their acceptance speeches or prize lectures are included. Plus there are the 25 writers who also uh, nominated those candidates for the prize. Their own encomia or nominating statements are included as well. So it's a, really a treasure of the past half century of international literature I wrote a historical introduction that kind of sets the stage for how we got to where we are today. Um, your preface also gives uh, a sense of the importance of the prize on the, on the world stage. And I'm really just excited to get it into readers' hands. It's, it's been a great uh, journey kind of digging through the archives and now uh, putting it all together and, and getting it out into the world. It's really a who's who of modern literature. And I'm kind of shamelessly plugging it. But the fact is the proceeds from this go to our scholarship fund that will really empower a lot of students to study with us and take courses and do things at the University of Oklahoma. Can I Indeed. say something? Uh, yeah, Kathy, go ahead. Um, so I was in my teens when the book started and to read the historical preface about how the how the awards started and what all the authors said about Oklahoma and winning the importance of this award was fascinating. I just loved it, and I've you know reading it by each author. It's it's fabulous and a, a wonderful treasure to have. I think people are going to love it. Okay, so the events scheduled for Tuesday, the twentieth of October, are phenomenal. At 3 p.m., there will be the panel sponsored by the American Literary Translators Association, one of our partners that we've done quite a few projects with, uh, and it'll be introduced by Nancy Naomi Carlson. This is a discussion with four eminent literary translators, David Bellows from Princeton University, Peter Constantine from the University of Connecticut, 
Alana Marie Levinson Labros and David Shook of Phoning Books. They will discuss why translation matters in a globalized world in a conversation moderated by Will Evans, publisher of Deep Bellum Books. At 5 p.m., four of Cadere's translators, David Bellos, Peter Constantine, uh, Anna Coco Bobo of the University of Kansas, and Fabrice Comte Williamson of the University of Wisconsin Parkside, will discuss the significance of Cadere's work in a conversation moderated by Emily Johnson from the University of Oklahoma. At 7 p.m. tomorrow night, this is a, a really big event. Kathy, you will announce the winner of the 2021 NSK Newstat Prize for Children's Literature. And that's going to be a really exciting moment. I can't, can't wait for that. Kathy, could you walk us through the last three sessions uh, that will take place on Wednesday, the 21st of October? Sure. So on Wednesday, uh, the last day of the Lit Fest, we'll start with at 10 a.m. Central Time. I have to say it because everybody's on every different time zone in the world, but 10 a.m. Central Time, where uh, the uh, OU School of Drama presents the English language premiere of Ismail um, Cotteret's play Stormy Weather on Mount Olympus. It's directed by OU Susan Shaughnessy and co-translated by Fabrice Conte Williamson and David Bellos. And afterwards, there will be a uh, talk back with the directors, translators, and actors. And then at 7 p.m. Central Time, we'll have the New Staff Prize Award and acceptance speech by um, Kadare. And this is the main event. My sisters, Nancy, Susan, and I will be awarding the New Staff International Prize for literature to Ismail Kadare of Albania. We'll watch as he received the prize at the American Embassy in Tirana. We'll listen to a tribute from his nominating juror, Kapta Kasabova. And we'll hear David Bellos read uh, Kadare's prize lecture, Dead Storms and Literature's New Horizon. Uh, RC will be presiding over that ceremony. And then afterwards, just some closing remarks from RC, Daniel, David Shook, and myself as we offer closing remarks and respond to viewers' questions. Actually, I'm not sure I am responding. I'm on that one, but I'm happy to give some closing remarks. It's going to be amazing. So that is Wednesday and the culmination of the Lit Fest. Okay, we've heard a little bit about all of the events of the, these three days. Kathy, Daniel, any favorite events that you're looking forward to that you want to share with us? All of them. I think <laughs> it's going to be way fun. Of course, I'm invested in uh, having the NSK jurors being with us in real time to deliberate and to announce the 10th. This is going to be the 10th winner of the NSK prize. So I'm very excited for that and to hear their own works and always the plays and the productions that they put together on Wednesday by OU interpreting the author's works is, is outstanding. Daniel, thank you. Daniel, any? Yeah, I would say, you know, of course, with the, the book launch tonight, I'm, I'm really proud of how that all turned out. And just to reiterate that the, that the the royalties from the first edition will go towards the New Stat Scholarship Fund, which uh, Kathy and Nancy's and uh, Susan's parents endowed uh, almost, well, just about 10 years ago now. And um, Walter and Dot have been really just friends to WLT and patrons of our work for, for decades. And, and also um, their grandmother, uh, Doris Newstadt, Westheimer Newstadt was also very key uh, back in um, the early 1970s and making the endowment happen, that initial uh, $600,000 endowment to make the prize more than, uh, more than just a small kind of a token amount. So it's, it's a $50,000 prize uh, now. It's, it's really renowned around the world for uh, its prestige and rivaling some of the great international prizes. And also the play, I would say, I've kind of worked closely with the director and the translators to make make that happen. And, you know, it's a world premiere. 
in English. It's a kind of a rewriting of the Prometheus myth, which uh, Cadere's audacious attempt to set Aeschylus's plays, famous trilogy, in the context of a 20th century totali totalitarian state. So instead of the eagles coming in to tear out the heart of Prometheus, there are helicopters that are attack helicopters. And there are all sorts of um, interesting analogies for you know, who, who Zeus is in terms of being a, a despot and who the supporting gods are in terms of their roles in, in enforcing the regime. So I think it'll be a really exciting um, kind of an allegory or parable very much in Cadere style to, to uh, help us to kind of think about how these, these tales from classical antiquity and from the Balkans region are really so relevant today. Daniel, I'm really glad you underlined the play because uh, I don't think there's any area of the arts and humanities so devastated during the pandemic as, as theater. And the brave attempt on this campus to create a radio play and work with something new and get it out there at a time when theater is just largely dead around the world, I think that is really, really very important. So um, we're really proud of that. We only have just a few minutes left uh, could I get you two to talk to me a little bit, and, and maybe I'll have something to say about this too, about the, I guess the, the promise of what we're doing, you know, and during the pandemic, so much of the time we feel like we're coping with things. Here we're coping with the fact that we can't have an in-person conference by having a virtual conference. But I, I, I think as some doors seem to close, others open. What's the, maybe what's the potential of what we're doing here that we could look forward to? Well, you know, I think now, unfortunately, but there is a silver lining where we're all used to getting together by not getting together. And we have Zoom and we have other meeting platforms and they have opened a lot of doors that, that physically were shuttered doors. So I think that this is really has such promise in, in just the fact that, like you said, 41 countries are represented here today. Never would we get that kind of audience in Oklahoma, in Norman. So we're opening this up to the world, which is just outstanding. I mean, we're, we found a way to shine a new light. And I, I just think this is, um, will take us into the future that maybe we can do hybrid models in the future for all the events so more people can see it live and I, I get the impression I I think probably we will never be the same I think even when we can go back to in person we're still going to reach out to the world because on a university campus maybe a thousand people a few hundred a thousand people would, would participate over the course of the next year as people watch the, the uh, recordings of these sessions, it could be hundreds of thousands of people. Um, so that, that is just mind boggling. It opens it up so much more to the world. We would have done this eventually, but we've had to do it much faster because of the pandemic. And I think that's really uh, good for us. Daniel, anything you wanna chime in along that line? I would just say, you know, thinking about the prize as a reaffirmation of culture, you know, when we're so disconnected or isolated in many ways these days. I think it really is a testament to the, um, the prize's original intent to focus on literary merit and also our, our role as, as, um, as a teaching university for our students to be inspired by living writers who connect with them in a way um, that perhaps some other you know, ancient uh, literature may, may not have that kind of immediate uh, uh, impact on their lives and they can see themselves as writers um, and, you know, working into the future, becoming um, inspired to, to do this work. So I really see it as kind of an, an extension of that original uh, intention of the charter that uh, Ivari Vosk developed back in 1969 and the Neustadt family's investment in that mission and our own um, stewardship of carrying that forward again. I think what you're saying is so important there's so much of a, a kind of militant nationalism around the world. And the Newstat program is all about connections and getting people to talk to each other from different parts of the world, just as you said. And, uh, and the, the greater impact that that, uh, that that belief is gonna have now through 
this technology is uh, it's just really wonderful. Um, I think our time is up. Uh, so um, I'm going to turn things over to Dean Fritzen and uh, we can start the roundtable. So as mentioned, our next event of the festival is Understanding the Balkans, a roundtable conversation. For those of you just joining us, I am serving as your host for this week's events, Carrie White. Dustin Condren will be our moderator for this particular session. And this roundtable is sponsored by OU's David L. Bourne College of International Studies. So now I would like to welcome Dr. Scott Fritzen, Dean of the College, Associate Provost of Global Engagement, and the William J. Crow Jr. Chair in Geopolitics, Geopolitics, I can't even read that word, let alone what, know what it means. So um, start us off, Dr. Fritzen. Oh, thank you so much, Carrie. Uh, greetings, everybody. My name is Scott Fritzen. I've been the Dean here at the College of International Studies for a whole three months, although three months in Zoom land seems to count more like uh, three years, uh, the way it feels these days. Uh, the College of International Studies is a hub for global engagement at the University of Oklahoma. We basically take care of all the international study abroad uh, programming, including at our uh, centers in Arezzo, Italy, and Puebla, Mexico. We also coordinate the services to all of OU's nearly 2,000 international students. We offer a number of academic programs in international and area studies. We host a number of global research centers, and we engage in collaborations wherever they may be productive. And allow me to invite anyone here who would like to collaborate with us to reach out. We'd love to hear from you. And a productive collaboration certainly describes our collaborations with world literature today. I don't know how many of you know that WLT was established in 1927. And certainly this long history has played an important role in uh, internationalizing uh, the University of Oklahoma. And uh, the College of International Studies and WLT have in turn collaborated on a range of issues from bringing new stat jurors to campus to special issues and moderating panels in each other's events among many other points of collaboration. This Zoom festival too is a great fitting example. It's a sincere pleasure for the college to sponsor this opening panel, Understanding the Balkans, a roundtable conversation in which we have three distinguished and very well-placed experts here to discuss the Balkan context of understanding Kadari's work. Uh, this conversation will be moderated by Dustin Condren, a, an assistant professor of Russian at OU. And I'll turn it over now to Dr. Condren. Just by way of introduction, we'll note that his own research focuses on the literature and intellectual culture of the early Soviet period and the visual and physical forms that often frame them. His current book project analyzes six of Soviet filmmaker and theoretician Sergei Eisenstein's film projects of the 1920s and 30s, a topic that would make for an excellent conversation in its own right, uh, a great panel as well. So that's too long for me, Dr. Condren. Uh, now over to you with thanks for moderating this panel. All right, thank you, Dr. Fritzen, for the introduction. And thank you to the many people at World Literature Today and the Neustadt Festival that have helped to organize this panel, um, specifically to Daniel Simon and to R.C. Davis Undiano for asking me to facilitate the roundtable discussion between, as we've heard, two distinguished scholars of history and literature and one poet of international renown. Indeed, it's my great pleasure to, um, to do so. So the conversation today is between Dr. John Cox of North Dakota State University. Hi, John. Dr. Ellen Green of the University of Oklahoma and the Albanian poet Lulieta Lishanaku. So welcome to all of our guests. Um, before we begin, I want to speak to all of you and the listening viewing audience on Zoom um, to echo some of the things that Carrie has just said and to say that in the spirit of the roundtable discussion, we would like to invite you to participate in the conversation as well. So the way that we propose doing this is having you submit questions through the chat function of Zoom um, at any point during the discussion. So that at the end of the session, we will hope to have time to respond to at least a handful of the questions. So if you have one, please do submit. 
Um, and for the sake of clarity, we'll ask you to format the question the following way, as, as Carrie pointed out, but I'm just going to ch uh, copy uh, an instance of it into the chat so that everyone can see. So all caps, question, and then your thoughtful question for everybody, or if you have a specific question for one of the panelists, question for Cox, question for Green, question for Lishanaku. Okay. So the topic of the conversation today is understanding the Balkans. And I'll take it as my task in the next couple of minutes to say a few brief words um, to lay some thematic groundwork before we move to our speakers and their presentations. And what I'd like to do in broad strokes for the non-experts among us is to focus our attention from the larger theme to the more specific one that is the cause for our gathering here virtually today. That is, I want to attempt to situate our speaker's conversation about Ismail Kadere in the wider context of our, that our panel advertises, and perhaps to modestly suggest that the best step toward even a small grasp of such a heterogeneous region is through the specific case. So it might be somewhat of a tautology, but perhaps one of the things most prohibitive to understanding the Balkans is just how difficult they are to understand, at least from a general point of view. And that's partially because both geopolitically and geographically what the Balkans comprise has never been fully a matter of universal consensus. In the Western imperialist terminology of the 19th century, what the term Balkan, when the term Balkan first began to be widely used, it indicated the lands, the mountain range through which the traveler might pass on the way from Central Europe to Constantinople, replacing terms such as Turkey and Europe um, which were used because of the region's long status then as part of the Ottoman Empire. And this despite the utter complexity and diversity of its cultural and ethnic makeup. Over the century since then, at least from a Western European perspective, the region has been defined as the nations populating the peninsula that runs south of the Sava and Danube rivers, bordered by the west, on the west by the Adriatic and Ionian seas, the east by the Black Sea, and the south by the Aegean and Turkey. But depending upon who's defining the term, other neighboring nations fall under the definition of Balkan. So current countries holding territory that, whether fully or in part, have been considered Balkan are Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Croatia, Greece, Kosovo, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Romania, Serbia, and Slovenia. And by some standards, the European portion of Turkey can be considered in this grouping. So by its broadest definition then, a sizable chunk of earth, just under 700,000 kilometers in the southeast corner of Europe, and the home to some 60 million people. It's a region for which boundaries, both internal and external, literary, literal and imaginary, have most always been in question. Slavoj Žižek, the Slovenian philosopher, in discussing the mutable otherness and othering that is often at play in defining the region, has quipped that the answer to the question of where the Balkans begin has always been just a little more to the Southeast. So the name itself even today is slippery because of the complex and often very troubled history of the region in the latter half of the 20th century about which we'll be hearing quite a bit today. There has been a movement in the last two decades to uh, depart from this terminology um, to leave behind the term Balkans and move toward the more conceptually open Southeast Europe. Uh, one might offer Albania as a possible um, instance of uh, an emblematic country for the Balkans, syncretic populations, divided affiliations, shifting formations, isolation, overrunning from outside. With traces of prehistoric inhabitants, Albania was the longtime home of ancient tribes. Uh, and for some time, it, sometime it marked the ancient meridian uh, between the Latin and the Greek spheres of influence. But once the Albanian people, a people unlike any others, speaking a language that has no known neighbors, once they had emerged as the predominant inhabitants of the area around the 11th century, this split condition would later be reflected in a nearly identical divide between regions affiliated with the Roman Catholic Church and Orthodox Christianity, the North and the South. And this picture grows more complicated with the four or five century Ottoman rule of Albania and the strong Islamic cultural influence that came with that. So these conceptual oppositions, Greek and Roman, Orthodox and Catholic, Muslim and Christian, and all of these bespeaking particular understandings of East and West, it could be said more or less color the entire Balkan region. 
And following Albania's 1912 independence from the Ottoman Empire and the perilous first decades of the 20th century, <clears throat> we might add to these oppositions the struggle between fascist or nationalist elements with communist ones up through the Second World War, uh, which ultimately led to the establishment of the People's Socialist Republic of Albania and the 44 year dictatorship of Enver Hoxha in which Stalinism, state atheism, isolationism, all further serve to perplex this picture. Uh, so here, let us arrive at the specific. Um, it's in this context of Hoxha's uh, dictatorship that Ismail Kadare, himself a figure of great complexity, began his literary activities. From the 1960s on, a writing deeply informed by these disparate cultural forces, a writing that seems both to stand in line with the dominant culture of its emergence and perpendicular to it, acutely uh, of its time, though gilded by local antiquity, a writing that is often two and more things at once. Cadere is at the center of all three of our talks today. And so let me turn the floor now over to the experts. Uh, the first speaker is John Cox. Uh, Dr. Cox is a professor of history in the Department of History, Philosophy and Re Religious Studies at North Dakota State University. He has published extensively on Balkan history and is the author of two significant books, 2002's The History of Serbia and 2005 Slovenia, Evolving Loyalties. He is also an accomplished literary translator from a number of Balkan languages, including Serbian, Bosnian, Croatian, and Slovene. His book-length translations, which span both fiction and nonfiction, include works by Biljana Jovanovic, Danilo Kish, Ivana Tsa Ivan Sankar, and several others. And among Dr. Cox's delivered and published papers, chapters, essays, and so on, are a number of works addressing the literary and cultural significance of Cadore, as well as at least one translation from French of Cadore's short story, The Abolition of the Profession of Cursor. So John will be speaking today about the contours of Albanian history up, into, up to the early 1990s and of uh, Cadere's place in both literary history and in European intellectual history, a place made secure not only by the beautiful and profound fiction through which he explores Albanian culture, but also for his search for the artistic idiom that can convey lived experience under radical communist dictatorship. John. Thank you, Dustin. Um, <clears throat> I really appreciate your uh, fresh and very relevant comments on Balkan history. Um, one can always quibble over definitions and, and dates and whatnot, but that was, that was fine work and it really set the stage, I think, for this whole conference very effectively. Um, hello, everyone else, and um, thank you for tuning in today. It is my job, as Dustin said, to offer the briefest possible overview of Albanian history um, because I know it's not a history class, but a lot of the twists and turns and more important, the trends uh, of Albanian history figure in Kadare's works and even inform them to uh, a tremendous degree and shape and frame many of them, I would go so far as to say. I will also, time permitting at the end here, make some comments on Albanian cultural specificity, a term I will use instead of uh, phrases such as national identity. Um, and I will also comment on Kadare's portrayal of the radical communist regime uh, in Albania, as Dustin indicated. Um, so the place of Ismail Kadare in literary history is, in my opinion, secure because his fiction and poetry are frankly so beautiful and so profound. So prolific is an additional virtue, but beauty and profundity are the keys. In addition, Kadare plays a major role in the intellectual history, not just of the Balkans or Southeastern Europe, but of Europe in general, because of his explorations of Albanian culture and because of his search for an artistic idiom to register the lived experience of Albanian Stalinism or radical communist dictatorship. First of all, some thoughts on Albanian history in general. The history of the people called the Albanians today, rather than the state called Albania, because for much of Albanians history, there was no actual state representing even the majority of the people, is both like and unlike the histories of neighboring peoples in the Balkans. I'll try to bring out some of those similarities and differences in the next couple of minutes, but 
I dare say that the history of Albania is probably radically different uh, from the West European histories that many of us know or teach or are brought up on, uh, the histories of Western Europe or certainly of North American societies or things that we're likely to receive in a generic Western civilization class. First of all, in medieval times, as Dustin pointed out, um, the Albanian peoples were suspended in a way between Eastern and Western Europe, between the Roman sphere of influence and the Byzantine sphere of influence, even though the Byzantines were Romans also, Romans of the Eastern and Greek variety, right? Um, the indeterminacy, if you will, of the Albanian people at this time, which is shared, I would argue, by many of their neighbors, many of the Albanians neighbors, especially uh, the various peoples in Bosnia, uh, is heightened by a sense of not just of being in between, the lands in between, to use Alan Palmer's great phrase about the Balkans, but it has to do with a relative state uh, in some ways of underdevelopment, not that all of the Balkans is underdeveloped, uh, certainly Greece and Constantinople are not historically, um, but the Balkans being difficult terrain, being thinly populated compared to many of the commercial centers of the Mediterranean or Europe, uh, Western Europe, excuse me, um, the Balkans are uh, a remote and rural location. Uh, and in addition, Albanian politics were such that the country lacks an imperial history. It does not lack entirely a state history or a history of administration or governance. Albania was a feudal state. It was a feudal collection, a feudal mesh of principalities and duchies at times subjected to Byzantine domination or manipulation at times to Venetian, uh, various uh, foreign families held thrones, at least uh, were titular overlords of parts of the uh, Albanian demosphere as we would see it today. But there was no actual uh, confirmed independent and viable Albanian state, um, uh, which is turns out to be in the 20th century, I guess. This is more a thing for a uh, question and answer than now, but turns out to be both a blessing and a curse. Uh, the point is though, that when the Ottoman Empire expanded into Europe, beginning in the 14th century, using a variety of means, not all military, but also the creation of vassal states and the linking of royal and princely family, families through marriages, et cetera, um, the Albanian territories were uh, in the 1300s and 1400s included in the new Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire that had already expanded to include most of the Arab world uh, and all of the Anatolian Peninsula. In the 400 plus years of Ottoman rule, the Albanian lands are not governed as one unit. They are divided up between various Sanjaks, Vilayets, Pashaluks, administra territorial administrative divisions of the Ottoman Empire, creating uh, yet another layer of sort of political dispersion, which figures in Kadare's works and which will be difficult for Albanians to overcome uh, and even condition their thinking uh, in the 20th century. This is also the time, these are the centuries uh, in which a large Muslim population in Albania emerges. Um, the Ottomans did not practice uh, forcible conversion on a large scale, uh, but through various uh, uh, social processes in Bulgaria, in Bosnia, uh, certainly in Albania, large Muslim populations emerge. And the position of the Albanian elite under the Ottoman Empire was a very precarious one uh, and one that sees Albanians respond to the extent that our records allow this and there is a, 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 a solid base of documentary evidence on this. Uh, some Albanian families rose high in the administration uh, in Istanbul of the Ottoman Empire, uh, some of them through the practice of the devshirma, the child levy, um, others uh, through various other economic connections. But there were, of course, also famous rebels uh, in the Albanian lands against Ottoman rule and attempts of various types to various degrees of success and using various 
registers of what is Albanian or what should be an Albania, there were famous rebels under the Ottomans. Uh, Skanderbeg is a, an Albanian national hero of the 15th century, much more than just a rebel, uh, a, a Renaissance figure of great renown across Europe. Skanderbeg uh, has counterparts, for instance, in Janos Hunyadi or Janko Sibinyanin, uh, the defender of Belgrade uh, at the same time in the 1450s, a great Hungarian, Romanian, Serbian figure who's an, a nice analog to Skanderbeg. Um, in many ways. The, there is uh, Muhammad Ali of Egypt, who in the late 1790s rose up through the ranks of the Ottoman military and eventually with a group of Albanian soldiers establishes himself all the way across the Mediterranean. And he does not try to link Egypt to Albania, but he is a, a, a measure, his career is a measure of the success uh, and ambition of certain Albanian leaders at this time. Perhaps the most interesting in Kadare's context would be Ali Pasha of Yanina, uh, an Albanian figure, um, a, a kind of local, no, a provincial notable, as Ottomans historians refer to them, who um, worked in southern Albania, the region where Kadare himself is from, and in northern Greece. It created a, a kind of parastate, uh, or even more, uh, in the Ottoman Empire at a time when center periphery relations were extremely fraught and uh, carried on diplomatic relations with foreign powers, hosted Lord Byron, uh, and attempted to gain full independence from the Ottoman Empire. So the Albanian experience, my point is, under the Ottomans was very diverse, very conflicted, uh, and um, often uh, either headline grabbing or tragic, uh, depending on your point of view. <clears throat> the Albanian national renaissance and then the manipulation of foreign powers and the gradual spread of the uh, ideology or rather the worldview of nationalism um, takes root in Albania by the last uh, two years before World War I, 1912 and 1913 see the um, uh, emergence, finally, one might say, of an Albanian nation state. Uh, I say finally, not because nation states are always inevitable in my view, but because most of the other major Balkan peoples had already developed nation states by this point. Um, World War I interrupted the, the development of the Albanian state and the successes of the foreign, of the German royal family put onto the throne there. Um, then Albania has a period of uh, interwar turbulence with uh, a republic and then a monarchy and then uh, Italian aggression by Mussolini and his fascists beginning in 1939. Um, Dustin mentioned uh, World War II uh, and the emergence of the Enver Hoxha regime, a regime that uh, can be specifically called uh, an Albanian form of uh, radical citadel nationalism uh, in, in, its, in its communist guise. Um, many people also refer to the Hoxha regime as, as um, uh, Albanian Stalinism um, because uh, uh, when Khrushchev launched the thaw, et cetera, uh, and uh, this sort of pushed Albania into a, an awkward position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, rivals in Yugoslavia and eventually the Albanians took up with distant China until Mao Zedong passes and the Chinese are then considered um, basically not Stalinist enough uh, for the Albanian communists and then they become thoroughly and independently a a maverick communist state, but in the opposite direction of Yugoslavia, uh, trending towards a kind of um, uh, uh, very, very hardcore, brutal uh, orthodoxy in terms of Stalinism. Um, so that's that's all the time we have for a historical background, to be sure. Um, and actually, my time is close to finished. So I will just I would just like to mention that um, the um, the role of culture uh, in the works of Ismail Kadare, culture that might be called a kind of ethno symbolism, uh, to use a phrase by Anthony Smith, a scholar of nationalism, uh, puts Kadare in the role of a kind of popularizer or even creator uh, of an Albanian sense of uh, modern nationalism uh, in the sense of Miroslav Roch and others um, uh, who, who who uh, uh, analyze specifically East European nationalism uh, at, at a very granular level. Um, 
I prefer to call Kadare's writings on um, Albanian society, traditional Alba Albanian society, or what some people call national identity. I like to call them explorations in cultural specificity. Uh, and they include uh, such elements, which you can find in the the, 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 not just in Kadare's um, essays, uh, but I'm talking here primarily about the ideas that uh, are attached to the vehicle of fictional works um, and, and put into uh, pan-European conversation in that way. Uh, these constituent elements uh, of cultural specificity include language, the land, the rifle, both as a symbol of resistance to outsiders and as a symbol of the perpetuation of the uh, of the blood feud or vendetta, uh, the pledge or Bessa, which has a lot to do with that blood feud, but also has a lot to do with uh, the Kanun in general, the code of customary law, um, as comes down from the Middle Ages. And finally, the idea of the gathering of the lands or redemption of the Albanian soul through um, uh, the, the the creation of a uh, of uh, an Albania on the map suitable uh, to demographic realities. There are other elements to these cultural specificities, and there are absences, big absences that some scholars also like to explore. I think together, though, they form a powerful whole. And when you read most Kadare novels, uh, you will be initiated uh, into a level of Albanian cultural specificity in a very deft and adroit way. Uh, one of the things I love so much about the novel Broken April, which is one of the two books I would absolutely recommend to anyone who wants to read Kadare as a historian or as a fan of history. Uh, Broken April is a marvelous treatise, uh, almost ethnographic, and I mean that in the po most positive sense of ethnographic. Uh, it is a marvelous window uh, into a reconstructed idea of Albanian traditional society. And it really, really works as a novel because the protagonist is a 360 degree character uh, with whom we can connect emotionally. The other novel I was hoping to have some time to talk about is the novel also dating from the early 1980s, the novel, The Palace of Dreams, which is at once Superficially, a study of the Ottoman superstate, uh, as the translator puts it in the translation of the book that I have. Um, it is also uh, a, an enormous allegory uh, uh, for Hoxha's um, 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 uh, dictatorial regime. Uh, and it gets very, very specific about historical and in even what we would call today uh, issues of political technology about how regimes work. And so it is a dystopia, um, but one rich in Balkan history and extremely rewarding to read in a very careful way. I apologize for my, to my fellow panelists for having gone over a bit uh, and I'll turn things back to Dustin. Um, thank you very much, John. That was uh, that was a wonderful um, presentation, and I, I really appreciate the way that you started your talk with the idea that um, that the key to um, to Cadere's sort of uh, stability in in uh, in terms of literary uh, reputation is is beauty and profundity specifically. Um, and yet, at the end of the talk, we arrive at these very specific factors that um, that have sort of um, ensured uh, the cultural uh, um, specificity. Um, and I wonder, and I think we probably have time for just a, a quick um, moment here. Um, I wonder if you might say something additionally here as we're, as we're all trying to approach an understanding of how Kadare stands um, for Albanian literature. Uh, if you might say something about this distinction you make between national identity and cultural specificity, why you choose the one over the other. Sure, uh, my use of vocabulary there may not be uh, the one that our author, our, our, our man of the week would, would choose. Um, I say that because I find in general discussions of national specific or national identity to be often normative or prescriptive instead of just descriptive. Uh, and uh, they cannot be as inclusive generally as reality actually is, or as uh, my responsibility as a scholar needs to be. Also, they're, they're often reductionistic and often uh, ideas about who belongs or what makes someone virtuous or authentic. These things change constantly over time. Uh, and no novelist, a novelist whose job is 
is uh, um, to, to trade in, to deal in uh, emotional truth, right? No, no novelist can cover every possible sociological angle of every possible issue. That's not what literature does. Uh, so I prefer to read it for what's actually there and then take the discussion of it uh, to a descriptive rather than a prescriptive level. Wonderful, and that takes us back to the idea of beauty being the sort of uh, the thing that uh, underwrites all of it. Um, uh, if, I, if I may just add one, one. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I just Go about ahead. beauty. I like the way you keep bringing that up. I uh, I first read Kadare's works, uh, some of them uh, that I found in English translation in the late 1990s. My brother-in-law in South Bend, if he is listening, and he probably is, he will remember how uh, he gave me a copy of The Palace of Dreams. And uh, I, every I, I no longer work actively on cadre uh, uh, issues. I've moved on to some other engagements over the past few years. But every time I return to his literature, I am impressed again equally or even more with the profundity and the beauty. It's, it's, a, it's a great joy to find an author and we all have our, hopefully our small personal repertory of authors to whom we return with joy and anticipation. And that's why I'm so glad to be on this panel. Thank you. Great, thanks John. And I think we'll, we can uh, transition pretty seamlessly here to uh, a specific reading of, of Cadere's work um, from, from a somewhat different perspective. Um, so our next, panelist is Dr. Ellen Green, who is a Joseph Paxton Presidential Professor of Classics and Letters at the University of Oklahoma, where she has taught for almost 30 years. Oh my God. Her research and publications focus <laughs> primarily on Greek and Roman lyric poetry, which particular, with particular emphasis on issues of gender and sexuality. She has published broadly, including monographs such as The Erotics of Domination, Male Desire and the Mistress in Latin Love Poetry, and has edited several volumes of essays on Greek and Roman poetry, including the new Sappho on old age from Harvard University Press and Oxford readings in Propertius from Oxford University Press. Dr. Green will be presenting today on the topic of ancient Greek tragedy and its bearing on the works of uh, Cadere and particularly on uh, the novella Agamemnon's daughter, Ellen. Thank you very much, Justin. Uh, I mean, Dustin, I, mean, I can't believe I said Justin. Um, I, I, want, I also want to thank Daniel Simon for inviting me, oh, wait a second. Yeah, for inviting me to participate in this exciting celebration of Cotteret's work. I really appreciate this. And I will admit that I have not, I had not read Cotteret before being invited to participate in this. So I, I, I've really been, I've welcomed the opportunity to engage with a new author. And I hope to read many more of his of his novels after this. And so today I'm going to be talking about some of the ways Kadare's work draws on ancient Greek, ancient Greek mythology and literature. Specifically, I will be discussing how the influence of the Greek tragic playwright Aeschylus can be seen in Kadare's novel, Kadare's novel, Agamemnon's Daughter. And I don't know how many of you have read it, but it's, I highly recommend it. In this novel, we see repeated explicit references to Aeschylus's tragic trilogy, Eurystia. Kadari leads his reader to view the tale he is telling through the lens of Greek tragedy by having his characters ruminate on the connections themselves. Why did Aeschylus appeal to Kadari? Aeschylus wrote in democratic and imperial Athens in fifth century BCE. His works are often viewed as immersed in and promoting democratic ideals of freedom and justice. And Aeschylus supposedly commemorated his embrace of these values in the conclusion to the Oristia. Cotteret wrote under the shadow and threat of one of the most isolated and restrictive communist regimes of the 20th century, Albania, as you, as you all know. In spite of this, Cotteret clearly felt an affinity with Aeschylus. Cotteret translated the Oristia into Albanian and wrote an analysis of Aeschylus as artist in the same period when he was writing his novel, Agamemnon's Daughter. Throughout, the, throughout his essay on Aeschylus, Cotteret makes clear how he sees similarities between the themes and imagery of Aeschylus and the history of Albania, especially the generational curse of blood and vendetta embodied in, and John mentioned this before, embodied in, in part in, in Bessa, the Albanian tradition of oath keeping and keeping one's promises to family and community. 
In both Agamemnon's Daughter and its companion novel, The Successor, which I won't have time to talk about today. However, it is not the tale of revenge and blood feud he seems interested in summoning up, but the threatening atmosphere of fear that defined life under tyranny. In Agamemnon's Daughter, a short novel written between 1984 and 1985, although not published until 2003, the story is told from the perspective of a young man, a television journalist, on the occasion of a May Day parade in Toronto in the early 1980s. He is devastated because his lover, Susanna, the daughter of a senior member of the Politburo and the successor to the dictator currently in power, has been ordered by her father to end their affair. Susanna's readiness to end this relationship, renouncing in effect her freedom to control her private life in order to facilitate her father's career shocks the narrator. And by the way, the narrator is never given a name. So that's why I'm going to be referring to him as the narrator because we don't know his name. And that's an interesting thing to talk about in and of itself, but I probably won't be talking about it specifically in, this, in my talk. So with a laconic statement, Susanna defines her consent to her father's request as sacrifice. The term strikes the narrator when he looks into a collection of ancient Greek myths and serendipitously comes across the myth of the sacrifice of Iphigenia. Almost forcing the analogy, he quickly draws a parallel between Susanna and Iphigenia and automatically ascribes the role of Agamemnon to Susanna's father. Although Susanna admits that she also suffers at the prospect of the loss, she quickly converts to her father's cause and by defining her decision as sacrifice, she opens the door to the semantics of the Greek myth. For those of you who might not remember, the story of Iphigenia's sacrifice by her father Agamemnon is drawn primarily from Aeschylus' trilogy, The Aristia, and from Euripides' play, Iphigenia at Aulis. I will briefly give you the basic outlines of the myth, and they're very, very basic. And it's much more complicated than what I'm about to say. Agamemnon is leading the Greek army to wage war in Troy to avenge the Trojan prince's abduction or seduction of Helen. While the Greeks are moored at the port of Aulis in northern Greece, Agamemnon is told he must sacrifice his daughter so that the Greek army can sail to Troy and Agamemnon can realize his ambitions. And I'll just, I'm gonna say a brief aside that I, don't, I didn't write down. In Aeschylus's play, Agamem in fact, throughout Greek literature, Agamemnon is portrayed really negatively. In Homer, he's portrayed negatively. In, in Aeschylus, he's portrayed negatively as someone who commits, um, well, uh, maybe not an atrocity, but someone who acts immorally. I mean, the human sacrifice was not something that was done in, in Greek culture, as far as we know. And it was definitely looked down upon. So I just wanted you to keep that in mind. So in Kadare's novel, in Kadare's novel, the narrator is focused on his lover, Susanna, and the loss of their relationship. As he makes his way to the state parade, faced with a hellish tableau of victims of the regime, Susanna's sacrifice becomes a harbinger, a looming threat of new repressions and, and oppressions by the state. Taking his place at the grandstand, he thinks, he thinks of Iphigenia's appeal to her father as she is about to be sacrificed and evokes her voice from Aeschylus' tragic text. And I quote, "'O oh, father, hear me,' she implored, young and innocent, though she felt her sobs and cries could not melt the stony hearts of men set on war." The narrator imagines the crowd of Greek soldiers hastening to the altar, much as he and others hasten to the parade stands. He tells us that the equivalence of Iphigenia and, and Susanna's sacrifice allows him to, quote, see in an instant a whole new side of the ancient drama. It made new sense of the relations between Agamemnon and the other leaders, of their power struggles and fallback positions, their reasons of state, their use of exemplary punishments and of terror, end quote. This realization leads the narrator directly into memories of a series of repressions, arrests, relegations, and executions that took place only a few years earlier at the state radio and TV station where he worked. He can understand why Agamemnon sacrificed Iphigenia because he understands now why Susanna was sacrificed. Like Agamemnon, the successor, Susanna's father, rejects kinship bonds in favor of bonds to the state. 
In a, in a totalitarian regime, considerations of family and the individual have no place. The narrator can see where these sacrifices and the power struggle and reasons of state that led to them would lead Albania. Cotteret wrote Agamemnon's daughter between 1984 to 1985, shortly after the suicide murder of Mehmet Shehu, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, probably, probably not, the successor and father of Susanna in the story. Cotteret suggested in his essay on Aeschylus that the reason Agamemnon sacrificed Iphigenia was because with this example of sacrifice, his men would not easily be able to turn back. Thus the sacrifice of Iphigenia was understood by Cotteret to be an example to the army of what one should be willing to sacrifice for the state. Likewise, the narrator in Cotteret's novel comes to the conclusion that the sacrifice of his relationship with Susanna marks the beginning of new calls for sacrifice from the people of Albania. They who had already given so much were now being asked to give up even those private mo moments left to them. Near the end of the novel, the narrator realizes the real reason why his mind had constructed, quote, an analogy with an ancient tragedy, end quote. The sacrifice demanded of his lover, Susanna, leads the narrator to a full recognition, not only of all the arbitrary sacrifices demanded by despotic leaders, but of the terror these sacrifices engender. What seems to interest Cotteret most is that everyone loses their moral compass when terror is the dominant psychological register of everyday life. The narrator tells us that, quote, each day we felt the cogs and wheels of collective guilt pushing us further down. We were obliged to take a stand, make accusations and fling mud at people, at ourselves in the first place, then at everyone else. It was a truly diabolical mechanism because once you've, deb once you've debased yourself, it's easy to sully everything around you. Every day, every hour that passed, stripped more flesh from moral values, end quote. At the end of the May Day Parade, only giant effigies of leaders left, le left leaning on walls, staring at a slant remain. These images remind the narrator of the disastrous moral effect of the regimes of the Albanian leader, Enver Ho Hoja, now I know how to pronounce it, and Agamemnon, Specifically, how these regimes, as he tells us, quote, leave a gaping hole that will never go away, end quote. At the end, at the end, when the crowd disperses, the narrator imagines the Greek soldiers leaving the scene of Iphigenia's brutal sacrifice. And he describes himself having a breakthrough. He realizes that, quote, if the supreme leader Agamemnon had sacrificed his own daughter, that meant that there would be no pity for anyone else either. End quote. But he also realizes that, quote, Susanna's sacrifice would certainly have consequences even bleaker than these horrors, end quote. The narrator concludes that, quote, Susanna was the harbinger of an irreversible impoverishment of ordinary life, end quote. The placards of the parade goers bear witness to this impoverishment, revolutionize life evermore, learning, labor, and military training. These messages, which the narrator has heard repeated over and over, reduce life to what he calls a stony waste, abolishing all recollection of thousands of years of pleasure. Sex, not to mention love, as refuges from, from, as refuges from state ideology, looms in both Agamemnon's daughter and its sequel, the successor. The intrusion of the state, even into this last sanctum, ultimately spells doom for the narrator and for the people of Albania. This is life under a tyranny. This is their Trojan War. The novel ends with the final image of the Greek soldiers sailing to Troy, leaving beyond, behind all hope. Quote, Greek ships are leaving the coast of Atlas for Troy. One by one, they haul up the anchors, spilling clumps of mud and stones into the choppy waters. The mooring lines are being cut like last hopes. The Trojan War has begun. Nothing now stands in the way of the final shriveling of our lives, end quote. One woman's sacrifice portends many others. But in Agamemnon's daughter, as in Aeschylus' Agamemnon, the sacrifice leads only to the destruction of the perpetrator. Susanna's father becomes the successor only to fall. 
just as Agamemnon's success in Troy leads to the doom that awaits him at home. In this novel, Cotteret's reading of the ancient story opens up new areas for interpretation. For me, seeing the sacrifice of Iphigenia in the light of modern Albania has completely transformed my understanding and appreciation of this foundational Greek myth. Throughout Greek literature, Agamemnon's sacrifice of his daughter is generally portrayed as a necessary evil. Kadare's text, Kadare's text allows us to see more fully the moral atrocity implicit in such a sacrifice. Thank you. Great, thank I mean, you so much, Ellen. There's a lot more I could have said. I could have spent another five pages talking about the other novel, The Successor. I could have talked about the play, but you know, well, the, the, maybe the we'll novel, get a maybe we'll yeah. get a chance to sort of pivot towards some of that. Um, I mean, Agamemnon's I, daughter warrants speaking about it for a mere five pages or five, you know, ten minutes. So anyway, thank you. Thanks. Um, I I really um, am compelled by the especially the way the way that where you have ended the the talk, sort of speaking about your own you know, sort of renewal of your own understanding of the myths, something that's, that's, uh, that you've been aware of, I'm sure, for quite a long time. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, in, in reading the book, one sort of asks the question, how much do I need to know about ancient myth in order to fully understand what's, what's happening um, here in the text? Uh, and one of the things that's so fascinating to me about, about the way the, the book is presented is that in one of the first few pages, we're almost given a footnote um, sort of of a, of a text that we might consult ourselves before going any further, which is Robert Graves' Greek myths, you know, because the, the narrator mentions picking this book up and leaping through it before he starts developing all these ideas about Agamemnon. Yeah. But I guess I'm just, I'm, I'm curious, your, your view here, um, how necessary is it to understand Greek mythology in order to, to get... I think it's necessary. I think it's necessary. <laughs> you know, I mean, you could read this book and get a lot out of it, but it... it well, you'd get a lot more out of it if you actually read. I think you'd have the best to read Aeschylus's Oresteia, his trilogy uh, that is our most, you know, represents our most complete complete representation of the sacrifice of Iphigenia in Greek in Greek mythology and literature. There's an and also Euripides play Euripides um, Iphigenia at Aulis is another important source, and I think. Um, Cotteret, I keep pronouncing his name wrong, I'm sorry, I keep going back and forth. Cotteret's um, novel, the novels, um, these two, you know, companion novels, um, I think, I think become more rich, become much more rich if you have a, a grounding in, in the ancient texts. I mean, I, obviously I'm biased because I read ancient texts and I'm but I do think it would really, it really makes a difference because there's so many references to, to Aeschylus and, and possibly Euripides. I and mean, some people think Euripides is a source, he doesn't say, but you know, I think just knowing the bare out, I mean, I think even if you, I suppose even if you know the bare outlines of the myth from reading like a book on myth, you would get more out of it than just reading the novel. But you get even more out of it if you read the literary sources. Right, and the, and the sources themselves aren't buried somewhere in the text, they're, they're all out in the open, sort of pointing the reader outward to, to sort of go off on their own to, to sort of determine the, the connections. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I wasn't able to see the chats because I was looking at my paper, so I, it was hard for me to see what people were saying at the, while I was speaking maybe i should look now well there's some interesting ideas about greek tragedy that i think we'll probably be able to come back to in our in our sort of open discussion um but i think you know leaving from this this point about the um Kutteray's decision to use ancient myth um and the way that he manipulates it within the novella i think is a is a perfect place for us to make a bridge over to our next speaker um uh, and that is uh Lulieta Leshanaku. Um, Lulieta is a, a pioneer, as she's been called, of Albanian poetry, and is the author of eight poetry co collections published in her native language, collections which have garnered numerous awards at home and abroad. 
Translations of her work have appeared in many languages, including at least four in English. Three of these are published by New Directions Press, notably her 2018 English language publication, Negative Space, uh, which was shortlisted for Canada's prestigious Griffin Poetry Prize. Uh, and typical of Lishanaku's work, as Michael Hoffman writes in the London Review of Books, it is, quote, full of absolutely striking passages and lines. Apart from her poetry and occasional work in publishing and screenwriting, Ms. Lishanaku also lectures at the Academy of Multimedia and Film, Marubi, in Tirana, Albania, where she teaches courses on script writing. Um, Lulieta will be speaking today on the realities of writing in the Albania of the Hoja regime, the mechanisms of censorship and importantly of self-censorship under such a regime and how these factors weighed on Kadare and his contemporaries. Lulieta. Thank you, Dustin. So uh, the topic I decided to talk about is the historical novel as a way to escape uh, censorship and self-censorship in Kadare's novels. So uh, when I got the invitation for this festival, I thought that uh, I'm not a scholar and there are already uh, a lot of plenty of reviews and whole researches about the work of Kadare. So I thought probably it would be uh, better if I uh, discuss about his work from another perspective a perspective I know better than, uh, let's say, an outsider. So uh, thinking about uh, all, all this, my, 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 this uh, let's say, my, my speech has to do uh, with the work of Kadare analyzed from the perspective how he could find his own path to avoid as much as possible censorship and self-censorship in Albania. So, Consciously or not, all art is a reflection of a certain, certain political context, especially in periods of historical upheaval, transformation, or shock. But there is an essential difference between art producing freedom, where political commitment is a writer's choice, and art produced in a totalitarian regime, where political commitment is an unavoidable thing. Even where it has not been obvious, the artwork is still a result of a political process of censorship and self-censorship, something difficult to be understood, especially by the Western reader, reader even more by, uh, so by the new generation. Uh, but communism as an ideology and communism as a system are two different things. As a simple illustration, let's take Yanis Ritsos, a devoted communist, but one who never lived in a communist country whose poems reflect freedom, truthfulness, courage, humanist intimacy, mysticism, something difficult to be found in the, in the poetry of the communist regimes. The irony is that uh, for the same poetical qualities, Yanis Ritsos would be held imprisoned in a communist state. Even, even his erotic, eroticism would be enough to have him attacked as a decadent poet. In response to censorship, to survive as a writer in such regimes, you were forced to make a lot of compromises with yourself or calculations, ideological or at least aesthetical ones, because for an artist, art is no less than an existential question. Without his art, the artist doesn't exist. By the way, it was painful for me to hear that even Anna Ahmatova, a very respected poet, uh, considered a dissident one, uh, after her husband her, and her son were executed, after 25 years of silence, she had to write a bunch of poems ab about Stalin, let's say praising Stalin. Now, uh, what about Kadare, whose works emerged and gained popularity during the communist regime in Albania? How could he manage to write novels, most of which could stand the test of time and gain such international, international rec recognition. I have tried to analyze his novels from this perspective and have made my own sp speculations, of course, if these are my own thoughts that I'm sharing with you in this short presentation. Now, just a short information, how did censorship work in Albania? The level of censor censorship in Albania, uh, in communist Albania was such that even the word censorship was censored. Here is how censorship is described 
in the official dictionary of the Albanian language of 1976. Uh, censorship is the review and control of the content of various works before publications, or the control of letters, telegrams, etc., before delivery, which is a practice in capitalist and revisionist countries, done by an official body or by a commissioner. So literary <clears throat> censorship worked in this way. As any other cultural and social institutions in the country, media and publishing houses were owned by the state, where instruments of the party were controlled by the party structures installed within them. Any text or book that was submitted for publication had to be analyzed by three reviewers, who first considered the ideological side, and in addition to rejecting the book, publishers were obliged to report to their uh, superiors, who were political bodies, for each case that was considered an act incompatible with the communist propaganda. In addition to party organizations, the secret service had their secret representatives in every important institution who also reported to their superiors. In the Central Committee of the party, however, there was an office which dealt with uh, specifically with propaganda. But sometimes it happened that even after a text or a book had passed all the institutional filters and was published, it still su was subject to censorship, political judgment, which led to the prohibition of the work, the punish punishment of the author with corrective work and uh, imprisonment. But in such cases, the act was usually used as a pretext to destroy individuals considered dangerous by regime, simply because they were somewhat more independent in their thoughts and tastes, which might become contagious, or they simply had an influential personality. As in Kadare's uh, Palace of Dreams, the state tried to control people's mind, their consciousness, and even their uh, subconsciousness. People were punished for, uh, more for what they were, not for what they did. It might, it might seem unbelievable but, unbelievable, but in the political trials, you often could hear such accusations as, you hate our system without having any of the evidence of action against the system. So let's go uh, back to Kadara. Self-censorship was even worse. On one side, it was the limits that the writer set for himself from the beginning, all the transformation that he was forced to make to his ideas in order to prevent the consequences when, on the other side, all this caution could take him unmistakably to a prefabricated work, to a cliche such as uh, socialist realism was, which Western critics should sarcastically call girl meets tractor. This process was even more evident in the poetry, since poetry by its nature exposes the author, his thoughts and emotions more than in other genres. On the other side, the underlying purpose of poetry, figurative language, the unavoidable ambiguity, not only went against the mass concept of art, but it could create much more room for ideological speculation in the author's disfavor. In this context, I can explain Kadare's shift from poetry to fiction. Uh, in this context, I can explain Kadare's shift to, from poetry to fiction, and it is a smart, smart gesture. In 1976, he almost closed his cycle as a poet. Write about what you know is the first advice that every writer gives because it is much easier and safer to, to deal with reality. But the majority of Kadare's work consists in the past, in history, tradition, myths, and rituals. Without a doubt <clears throat> that such literature has exoticism within. It is the right of every author in the world to seek exoticism, even more if you are an, an author in a small country with a language spoken for a little more than 100 years and an isolated culture for centuries. We all know that that is the way how a publishing industry works. But in Kadare's case, given the circumstances in which it was written, descending to the past is much more than that. It is in a way to escape reality, protecting in this way his work from dogmatization. The explanation is that the past already has a defined status. It's cleaned by the emotions, it's purified. This is a consensus about it. 
so it doesn't provoke conflicts anymore. We tend to reflect about the distant past more abstractly than we think about the present. But dealing with the reality was a trap. However, you would project it in your, in your artwork, however you would project it in your artwork, it would leave room for ideological interpretation. So the past offered somewhat of a safer route for Kadarev. Uh, there are a series of historical uh, novels of Kadarev based on that Ottoman period, for example, like the castle, palace of dreams, even in a metaphor, as a metaphor, and so on. We, despite their exoticism, served primarily as a smart tactical solution for him. Uh, I would agree with Marinus Osewar's observation that in Kadare's novels, everyday exist existence is gloomy, cruel, and sterile. It reminds one of death, but in Kadare's idyllical being of the past, a heroic past, there is light, humaniness, real European culture. Kadare's idyllical Albania is the opposite of and the alternative to the contemporary modern Albania under Hoda's Stalinist rule. So that's how reality was indeed sterile. What was left for the writer to do was at least hide or minimize the banality, which Kadare managed to do through the creation of a certain artificial distance from it, something that reflected the entire atmosphere of novels uh, that were focused in reality. The same argument applies to mythological references such as the novels The Breach of Three Ar 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 Arcs and Who Brought Dorontina. But dealing with me is not easy. While for an anthropologist, the description of a myth is enough, a writer must necessarily turn it into a literary subject, explaining the extraordinary through ordinary. Even more difficult would be dealing with the myth of the dead brother, which is also the subject of a novel who brought Dorontina, one of my favorite novels, given the fact that every form of mysticism, including the religious, was a violation of dialectical materialism and such as became unacceptable by the censorship of the time. There are exactly the moments when the writer's brilliant imagination stands out. By giving an almost thriller character to the story, including the church, let's remember that Albania was an atheistic country, and reserving an old conflict between the Catholic Church and Orthodox Church in the plot, Kadare managed to temporarily shift the logical emphasis somewhere else in the aim of distracting official attention from the mystical nature of the story, which is the, resurrec the resurrection of the dead preserving this way the myth intact. Of course, the solution of the novel is unclear or there is no solution at all because the solution would be the death of myth. Whereas the preservation of myth also preserve its moral message, that is the promise. Another challenge is the novel Broken April, which is about blood fuels, one of the social calls of Albanians. The communist ideology of the time preached the new world against the old world, opposing in this way every traditional custom and moral code, calling, calling it um, contemptuously uh, medieval, uh, patriarchal and conservative, as much as in the early 1960s in the same areas of, of Albania, the names of people were changed to be replaced with new names or artisanal furnitures and ornaments were replaced with plastic ones produced in industrial, industrial uh, cooperatives. The question is, how would you deal with such a topic, which among other things carries a kind of cruelty within it? The most important calculation that Kadare makes in this novel is the setting of the event, event in the time of the monarchy, which was the target of the communist propaganda, blaming poverty, poverty as a cause and the cause of it, uh, of this, uh, le uh, let's say, which feeds this phenomenon. Theoretically, this is an illusion that you can neither accept nor reject. But in this case, this intrigue serves as a lifeboat for the novel. But after a certain time, in the reader's memory, these arguments are forgotten. What remains in mind is simply the drama of blood feuds, 
a habit rooted in the cause of self-government from the Middle Ages, which, by the way, by the way Kadare treats it, by the dignity he gives to the characters, the solemnity he gives to the drama, and the well-disguised metaphysical air that accompanies it, inspires respect. And much more than that, with Broken April, Kadare offers a kind of Balkan landscape with death as a part of life, where rules, codes, codes, honor gave meaning to existence. Other subjects that reflect a political consensus, even though the events take place in the present are the novels, the general of the Dead Army, <clears throat> about the Second World War and the concert at the end of the winter about the break of Albania's political partnership with communist China. Big Winter also evokes a positive turning point in the history of Albania, that of, uh, of the withdrawal of Albania from the Warsaw Pact. It remains one of Kadare's best novels, but the figure of the dictator at the center makes it one of his the most discussed works. The irony is that even this novel, which may be considered probably the Kadare's biggest compromise with himself, was prone of censorship, starting from the title, which in the first version was something like Winter of a Long Solitude. Knowing the extreme mechanism of control over literature and art production that I try to briefly show in this presentation, perhaps it might be excessive to expect, might be exaggerating to expect from Kadare to reflect the real Albania in his work. The Albania of prisons and internment camps, the Albania of execution at the borders, the Albania of extreme poverty, just as it might be considered ex excessive to expect in his novels characters that challenge the circumstances who could become the moral healer of each of us, because if the regime had eliminated them from the real life, how could they tolerate their presence in literature? But Kadare himself is more aware than any of us about his question, which finds its expression, especially in a character of the noble daughter of Agamemnon, Agamemnon the famous painter uh, T.D., who seems, in my opinion, to be Kadare himself, or the way he was perceived by the outside. I am qu uh, quoting. Some said that uh, with his work, he played that role. Others thought not. Rather, much more was expected from him, they insisted even more because he knew they could do nothing against him. He knew very well that nothing, nothing could be done to him. So why not take an advantage of it? And the response, however, both sides agree that, this, uh, that his relations with the state remained a mystery. At what price had he bought this? Because like all of us, he had his own ego, the most horrible of all perhaps, that was carrying him through the darkness. As a conclusion, so it was my curiosity as a writer that encouraged me to try to analyze his work from this perspective. The way talent, artistic intuition, and intelligence can help the artist to find his way, even in the conditions of ex extreme censorship in a, in a totalitarian state. But this is not a reader's concern. For them, the process does not matter at all. They have some of his uh, brilliant works in their hands, can enjoy them, and that's enough. The rest is just a question of art and so sociology. Sorry, my, my English was a bit, you know, I'm not sure if you got everything, but. No, I think it was, I think it was quite easy to, de to decipher and understand. Thank you, Lulieta. Um, and nice to end on this note too of um, the sort of artistic intuition that um, is the is the key to um, uh, to the novel's ability to navigate the difficult um, terrain of reality and the sort of um, uh, in this case as as you frame it history that it um, that it uses. Um, Ellen mentioned the in in Agamemnon's daughter this idea of the sort of diabolical mechanism of dictatorship that caused such self censorship and of course we know those of us who study um, Eastern Europe and and um, especially the um, Leninist Stalinist um, direction of communism 
that uh, self-criticism is a huge um, aspect of uh, sort of um, orthodox party life. And, and I'm curious if there were um, in these um, sort of attempts um, that writers made um, to um, censor themselves before submitting their works, um, whether there were any sort of pasts that were considered um, more orthodox to use, which is to say pasts that were a sort of more complicated question rather than say the sort of abstruse past of Greek mythology. Because um, we know of course that, um, that um, the sort of medieval Albanian past is also at play in some works. So, uh, well, as I said, this past is the past. It's, it, it was much easier to deal with it. Uh, but uh, it's up more, it's not about uh, where more than how in this case, you know. So uh, I told you even the, let's say, uh, the period of uh, monarchy was, uh, was considered kind of taboo, let's say, you know. You had to treat it. I'm just talking about, uh, uh, about uh, late history. I'm not talking about, you know, old age or 2000 years ago. But it, you should be even uh, treating about Ottoman period, for example, like Hadara did. You anyway, you should be very careful, especially um, making uh, uh, making sure that your 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 uh, let's say your subject will not, uh, or at least couldn't be metaphorically, you know. So that's, that you should avoid metaphor, you know, when, when dealing with the past, this was very important. Now it's, it's like, uh, let's say, now we can read different the work of Kadare. There are two different, there are many indeed different perception. You could perceive different the work in Kadare before the collapse of regime, and you can, uh, uh, let's say, perceive different now. It, it, it can be perceived uh, different from outside, it can be, and different from inside. So uh, even, yeah, now we can see that, yes, there were metaphors, you can find allegory, probably, you know, um, low, most of, it, more, most of his, uh, let's say, historical novels can be read as allegory. But the question is that knowing well the mechanism, how censorship works, we have the, the predisposition not to get the allegory, you know, the metaphor. So because we, uh, we knew that, it was so difficult, you know, to, to say, to, to pass that filter. So we had predisposition to read it literally. I'm not saying that everybody read that literally, you know, it depends on the intellectual and background, you know, but anyway, the most of the people, and uh, especially during the 80s, all this propaganda, you know, during the 80s was uh, by the, let's say, by the, by the regime was almost, uh, and let's say they succeeded to realize, to do what they aim to do, homo sovieticus, so let's say, homo albanicus, let's call it, which is the uh, analogy with the homo sovieticus from Soviet Union. So it means that uh, people were uh, just being five, almost five decades isolated, isolated from physically from the world, isolated from the information, culturally isolated, so uh, let's say it was so difficult to find, uh, to ask for a signal or to get a signal during that period. So we read everything literally, what was given to us, you know? I know if I explain that well, you know, so he said that, yes, uh, some of works of Kadare can be read as a metaphor, as allegory, you know, but we perceive them different now from how we used to perceive, you know, before 90s, because we knew how the mechanism worked. We thought that they are not going to let anything, which is kind of have a dissident, you know, message to be public. So that's why we prejudged the mechanism. We judged the mechanism, so we were more, let's say, uh, how do you say, naive to, you know, to reading the literature or getting some hidden uh, message through the art. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, having that specific uh, personal perspective, the personal experience, I think, does help us to to see the work maybe even more prismatically too. Right? That it can be um, that it can have one sort of um, that it can carry one sort of meaning now. For example, for all of us at a at a festival like this, 
Um, whereas in the 1980s, in the specific context of its origin, a uh, somewhat different one. Um, so right now we have about uh, just over 15 minutes remaining in our panel. And I wanted to give our panelists first, before we move to um, questions from the, the Zoom audience, um, to give the panelists a chance to talk to one another about their, um, their presentations. Um, so um, let me just remind the audience that if you do have questions, please continue submitting them, all caps, question, colon, and then your question. Um, but meanwhile, let's, um, let's give Ellen, Lulietta, and John a chance to, to um, talk to each other. Uh, I, have I have a question, question for Ellen, if I may. Oh, okay, sure. Ellen, no, were you already speaking? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I had a question for Lulietta, but let's... No, no, since she just no, spoke... No, 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 why don't you ask me? Oh, oh. well, I don't know. Oh. You guys need me to moderate? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mary, please. Yeah, I, I heard John's voice. This is this is experience of teaching on Zoom. I heard John's voice just before Ellen. So we'll let John have his question first and then we'll right. have Ellen's okay. question. Right. Um, I wonder if Ellen would like to build on a theme that Lulietta just broached, um, what we might call an extra literary reason uh, for Kadare to explore Greek myth or Greek tragedy in particular, these works of Aeschylus. So if if uh, you know the what what um, scholars of German literature call the inner immigration, right? The uh, internal uh, flight uh, into a safe historical topic uh, in a time of uh, of dictatorship. Besides that, which Lulietta brought up, do you think, Ellen, there could be other reasons to invoke um, the classical heritage of Europe or of the Balkan Peninsula? Does it somehow show that the Albanian language is uh, up to snuff with uh, translating and discussing great works of literature on par with English, Spanish, Russian, French. Could it be something that underscores the essential westernness of Albania or provides a unifying message for Albanians of different, you know, from the two regions, uh, 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 the Gags and the Tosks? Could this be a, a unifying topic in addition to a safe one? I mean, uh, in reference to your um, last point, John, um, I really don't know the answer to that. I don't know enough about the region and I don't know enough about the, you know, all the different aspects of the region and what, you, you know, so, I mean, my, you, you're, you're coming at this from an historical perspective, which I don't have, unfortunately. I wish I did. And I'd, and I'd like to learn more about it. And, you know, I will, um, but, as to your question about why, what were some of the reasons why he might be using drawing on Greek mythology and literature? Um, you know, I mean, there are a lot of different possibilities. One, you know, the thing you already mentioned about how it kind of, um, it possibly, it serves to bring Albania into sort of, um, you know, out of out of bringing into Western civilization, you know, what is generally regarded as is essentially as very Western. I mean, the Greeks are you know considered to be the foundations of Western civilization. So that certainly could be one reason. But I, I think it's deeper than that. I think that particularly drawing on Greek tragedy, I think um, it's possible that. He wants us to see that the world of Albania, the world that he's he's depicting in his novels, 1980s Albania, um, under the tyranny of of you know dictatorship, um, ev you know it naturally evokes Greek tragedy and and the the, the idea that um, that people who who were forced to live under this. Um, that they were kind of lurching, you know, into this uh, nightmarish world of, you know, savagery and blood feuds and all of that. Um, even though I don't think that's the primary aspect of Agamemnon's daughter that he, he focuses on. But I do think that, you know, the fact that he, he draws on Aeschylus in particular, which is, you know, has so much to do with blood feuds um, from one generation to another, I think we can't help but, 
you know, but but apply that to the Albania in his novels um, and the terror that is associated with it. I don't know if that's a good enough answer. It probably yeah. isn't. I, I feel like I need to do more work on this myself. Thank you. you know. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask Lili Lilietta, when you talked about metaphor, about, you know, Cotteret being metaphorical in his work, what, what did you mean by that? So, uh, for example, the daughter of Agamemnon, you know, that this analogy is not a metaphor. It's like, for example, uh, in his historical novels, let's say the castle, what we understand with castle, it can be allegory, an allegory about Albania, you know? So that's what I'm talking about. So, but did we get in, that, in this way or not? This is the question. So, or, or uh, the pyramid, you know, it can also be an allegory of Albania, but did we get in this way or not? So I'm talking about these messages said that how his messages could be, uh, let's say, could be heard in different way in different time. We could be, we couldn't get, you know, or I'm talking about for both majority of, you know, people, I'm not talking about particular cases. But was it perceived, you know, as a message against the totalitarian regime or not? That's what I'm talking about. Hmm. Or, or I don't know. Did I got your question? It's like I, I, I'm not. Well, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I thought you meant something else. I misinterpreted you. So that's all right. You know, because in, in, in Agamemnon's daughter, for example, the characters are, except for the only person who's named specifically is the lover who has rejected, or, you know, who has made the sacrifice, Susanna. But everybody else, narrator's no name, and the people that, um, that a narrator encounters are all um, named just by their, the, the abbreviations, like, K said such and such, or, you know, and is that to protect the people? Um, is it, I mean, he could have given them fictional names. So it, why? It, sorry, sorry, I didn't get it. But the question is that this novel, as you know, the story of the novel is published after the collapse of the regime. That novel couldn't be published before 90s, you know, because it's, it's, uh, they talked about, you know, political, you know, uh, punishment and other things. It was impossible to be published before 91. In that, in that form we get now. Uh, but as a metaphor, by the way, you mentioned that, is that indeed I don't read this story, uh, I read beyond it. I find it as an allegory of the regime, not just uh, of the leadership of the party, you know, how they sacrifice their sons. It's a, I find it's a metaphor regime because by the end of the, the time, they started to eat their offsprings, you know. All that, let's say, a communist anti -res resistance was eliminated to end it up uh, uh, on, at the end of 50s. And then all the, uh, let's say, the tentatives for the dissidents were totally destroyed. So by the end of their existence, of his existence, the regime started to eat their offspring. So this, it, it was, let's kind of, uh, so they created new enemies which were uh, in between them. So that's how I read the story. It's not, uh, in my opinion, it's just not a break, uh, let's say a, a love relationship and how a leader decided to sacrifice, you know, the love of his daughter just to, uh, let's say for his power, something like that. I find it is something more, you know, what is happening with the regime. So the, the, the regime was eating itself. You know, it was almost the end of it. it, was eating itself. That's how I read the story. That's the allegory for me. Well, what about the idea of sacrifice? I mean, that's so, yeah, but, you know. Yeah, but that's a sacrifice. So which just, it's just like, uh, you, you, it's like the same with your daughter, you know, they all used to be 
uh, let's say, powerful persons once, you know, let's say the director of television, you know, he was a part of propaganda too. He was an instrument of propaganda, but what happened with him after that? That's the way how I interpreted, you know, eating their offsprings, its offspring, offsprings, you know. Uh, did I get the right word? It's like, uh, so now they, they were over with the traditional enemies. No uh, anti-communists anymore around. So what to do? They started to consume themselves. The system started to consume the, the, itself. I think this is, this is an important point about the sort of uh, um, the self and then the sort of self as represented by um, say the, the unnamed successor and his, his offspring, his daughter, right? that there's a sort of continuation. Yeah, but this, this uh, is a real story, I agree. I, I read this version that uh, it's, uh, let's say, kind of based in uh, the story of prime minister who was, uh, who did suicide, who was probably the, the, the closest person to the dictator, but I don't think it's, I don't think Kadare I mean, was concerned, you know, to, just on that story, you know, for me, it's, it's not that, it's much more than that. What was happening with the regime, you know, ar around during 80s, in, on 80s, even the, those who were, let's say, very dedicated communists were, were in power, were in risk, everybody was in risk, you know, you never knew. And he explained, Kader explains perfectly that nobody knew, everybody was scared. You couldn't believe to anybody, even to your own skin. So that was a situation on, uh, you know, by the end of the regime during the 80s. Yeah, I think um, so. In the in the few minutes that we have left, we want to still be able to turn toward the audience. And and uh, Ellen mentioned in in the connection with this discussion the um, the naming of Susanna as the only named character in um, in the novella. Um, and this uh, lines up pretty nicely with one of our uh, questions from. Um, uh, Let's see, Jody Farmer, who asks, uh, could we explain further the importance of names Kadare uses in his books? For example, Broken April and Palace of Dreams, how these feuds last generation after generation and must end in death. It, it is so ingrained in the characters of these books to continue in their traditions they know instead of allowing for change. Um, do, do any of you have um, ideas that, that can respond to that? John probably does. <laughs> Um, John, I see your hand. Do you, yeah. Do you think uh, uh, our listener is curious about the titles of the books or the names within those two novels? Oh, so this is okay. This is a good question. Um, if uh, yes. if Jody, if you want to type into the chat, I mean, John, what's your instinct? If you want to oh, pursue okay. one or the other, well, I say the, the titles but, of the books. I think is is a brief but but perhaps more productive thing to look at. Uh, I've often wondered about the title Broken April and I've at various talks um, and in various classes with students who tend to love that book I've floated various possibilities. Um, April uh, being um, uh, the month in which the blood feud uh, has come into its new level uh, and has enveloped the protagonist of the book uh, uh, Jorg Berisha uh, so the, his life is being interrupted. It's being broken in the month of April. I've also thought it could be a reflection of the landscape. Uh, the book seems to be placed in sort of north central Albania, highly mountainous region. Of course, that's where the, um, the majority of the blood feuds were anyway. Um, so it could refer to the topography of the area. Uh, I, I've also wondered if it was, um, because there are intimations that the characters, if not uh, the protagonist himself, some of the ancillary characters are questioning the value of the blood feud. Should it continue? Does it need to be modernized away? Uh, there are uh, aspects of, of uh, motorized civilization uh, on land and air that are starting to appear in the book. Could this be the interruption to a caesura in the history, uh, uh, a broken history of the blood feud itself? Palace of Dreams, uh, I asked a bunch of Ottoman scholars about when I first uh, became interested in that book 20 plus years ago. There was no Palace of Dreams in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it is, uh, uh, it is a, a, a gigantic metaphor for an intelligence organization, uh, the creepiest of creepy. Thank you, John. Yeah, so we heard from Jody that, that, that she was interested in the titles of the book. So, oh, okay. so Great perfect question. Art, artistic Great intuition question. there. Also, she was also asking about the characters, she said. 
There's... Well, the only character I can think of that has a name that off the off, on the fly like this, uh, the protagonist in the Palace of Dreams is named Mark Alem, and I don't know whether the first name is significant or not, but his last name, Koprulu in Turkish, uh, is the name of a famous Albanian family of grand viziers and potentates and uh, provincial notables in the empire, most of whom shored up Ottoman power. Uh, so there's a, there's a gap posited in the book between the uh, Albanian traditions of this family and the Istanbul reality of this family. Uh, and I think the name is important in unearthing that um, uh, disjuncture. I, I, I think in, in Agamemnon's daughter, the fact that um, Kadare, uh most everybody has, doesn't have a name. Nobody has a name except for the daughter of um, the daughter of the successor, Susanna, and the lover of the narrator. Um, because I think he's trying to emphasize the the sort of invisibility of people and their, and their fear. They're they're constant. They're, the way they're living under fear, and they can't reveal their identities. Um, and I think that's probably why the narrator doesn't have a name, which is a huge, I mean, that's huge for the narrator not to have a name. But also, you know, one thing I wasn't able to talk about very much, but that, that really struck me in the novel is that when the narrator is walking to, you know, most of the novel is the narrator walking to the parade, to the grandstand in the, at the end of the, you know, at the, uh, the parade. Um, and the various people he encounters along the way and, and also the thoughts going on in his head. But the people he encounters along the way are all people who are defined sort of by their role, you know, like, like an artist or a, um, you know, a journalist or something. Um, and they all, they're all, sort of, they're all victims of the regime in various ways. And um, there's, it's kind of a hellish tableau, as I mentioned before. It's kind of like he's walking through Dante's Inferno, encountering these people, and it's portrayed it's portrayed very effectively that way, as a as a hellish, it's a kind of hellscape um, of these victims of the of this totalitarian regime, and who, who are sort of nameless and brute, but yet brutalized. So I, that's very that was very effective, and that really struck me. Thank you, Ellen. Um, unfortunately, we are all, all out of time. We had some more very compelling questions that we weren't um, able to get to, but um, nevertheless, I think that we were able to, to definitely dig up some very interesting um, uh, questions, ideas, and, uh, and I think a nice way of starting uh, the week of, of um, discussion about Cadre's work. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Um, Fritzen and the University of Oklahoma's Bourne College of International Studies again for um, sponsoring our panel. And I want to thank again our panelists, John Cox, Ellen Green, and Lulietta Lishanaku for their presentations. Um, and I will turn the word back over to Carrie White. Thank you so much. What a wonderful conversation. Thank you all.